Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Fail Fast podcast. Today, we have a guest who, at the age of six, started his first business selling jewelry on the street. Then, at the age of 13, he graduated to trading stocks. And today, he's the president and CEO of SellYourMac.com. Here we have Brian Burke. Brian, how Thanks are you? Thanks for having me, Quinn. Excited to be on your show and sit share some of the failures that have turned into successes along the way. Awesome. I can't wait to hear it. So uh, before we go anywhere, um, you were buying stock at really young age and you were, you bought some Apple stock. So I started buying Apple mainly uh, when I was going off to college. So the first big slug of Apple stock I bought was about 2002. But before that, I was focusing on other companies in the tech space that I was very familiar with. Uh, Intel was a big one and uh, some other you know, large players out there. But it's really got my motivation out of you know, the ability to kind of do the arbitrage sales was very exciting to me. And I was reading all these you know, Jim Cramer books and stuff like that, trying, trying to learn the ways on how to be an awesome trader. Wow. So back then, how much was an Apple uh, stock? How much was it worth? So when I first started buying it, it was $16, but since then it split seven to one and then two for one. So effectively it's about $2 and a quarter uh, per share. And now it's about 210. Nice. Nice. So I hope you been a good ride. <laughs> I hope you got many back then. That was awesome. Yes. Haven't Ooh. sold it. Oh, no. Good for you. That is so um, really good technique. So I see that you're always learning and there's something that um, I saw that you're like a a certified Mac technician, which I guess that's obvious. Notary public, an ordained minister, you're a certified scuba diver and a sommelier. What is that one? Sommelier, yes. Sommelier. is a wine expert. Wine so the, expert. The job of a job of a psalm is really to sell wine, but for me, it was more the learning experience, how to talk about it uh, more knowledgeably, and be able to share it with others. You know, I've had a huge passion for wine growing up. You know, I used to have a sip of wine at dinner just to understand it more and kind of grow my palate over the years. And I, I, I think it's partly I do have a good palate and a good nose to be able to detect some of the nuances. I love, you know, talking about wine and sharing great wine with people and sitting on recommendations to others. That's such a great, uh, I guess, are you certified on it? Is that what it is? So I'm a level one sommelier. And the, the track that I went through is called the Court of Master Sommeliers. Yeah. So there's four levels to that. If anyone out there has seen the movie Psalm, those guys are level three trying to get their level four master sommelier, and that is the highest in the world. Wow. So I guess so I'm, at, I'm at the base, but I'm good with that for now. You know, when I went to the, the test, I was the only person that was in business uh, at the whole, in the whole group. There's probably over a hundred people taking the test that day. And a lot of other people I knew were, uh, you know, some of the top, people working at restaurants around town. They're like, what are you doing here, Brian? (laughs) That would be probably the one thing that everybody gets excited for a test. Hey kids, (laughs) pop (laughs) the surprise test today. Yeah, you get to do some wine tasting and then you get to answer some wine questions. (laughs) Yeah, and if you fail, you get to do it again. (laughs) Yeah, you gotta wait though, so. Oh yeah. Oh man, that's, that's amazing. And then um, ordain. If if anyone out there wants to learn more about wine, I really encourage you to pick up a book called the wine Bible. And that is by Karen McNeil. And if you read the first three or 400 pages of that, you'll get an unbelievable understanding of wine and how it came about in the world. Really cool background. And it'll boost your knowledge for any dinner parties you might be at. Awesome. I'll make sure to put that one on the show notes (laughs) so they can grab it. And now, what is an ordained minister? It's actually fairly easy to become a minister. This all happened when I was getting married a few years ago. And got kind of last minute, the uh, person that was going to marry us backed out. Wow. And I had talked to my uncle, who's also my godfather, and asked him if he would marry us. 
and he he agreed to do so. So we looked into it, and it's really an online form that you fill out and you become a minister and you have the credentials to marry someone. It's, it's pretty powerful. <laughs> wow. wow. It's, I have I, not married anyone yet, but it's going to be coming soon. I haven't put the vibes out there to the universe <laughs> that I need to be marrying someone. So if someone's on this show and wants to get married, hopefully they're close, uh, close to Ohio and I can't guarantee I'm going to, I'm going to travel you know, across the country, but let me know. I'll try to do what I can. There you go. You can get married. And at the same time, uh, buy a Mac or sell, sell one. <laughs> kind, of, kind of combining the ordained minister uh, with the wine uh, sommelier um, and the scuba diving. I was, I was telling people I could marry you underwater and pair the wines for your wedding. <laughs> you know what? That, there, <laughs> there could be a business in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and we can have Macs and iPads at every table, whatever the people want. Nice, nice. So Brian, um, you had a Tesla and you sold your Tesla. Can you tell us why you sold it? So the truth is it's not actually sold. I did have it up for sale, but I ended up not selling it. And the reason I kept it was to make sure I could take my daughter to school more often. I had been on a huge kick of doing Uber and Lyft and it was great. I was getting a ton of work accomplished on the road but I was not taking my daughter to school and I wanted to do better for my family in that regard. So I did keep it and I'm still driving it. Um, <laughs> but I do Uber and Lyft a ton. I, I honestly, I love the uh, uh, attention I can pay to my work and to a phone call, not having to be driving as well. I know. Isn't it fantastic being able to go somewhere when somebody's driving you and oh man, just you can do whatever you want. I could be podcasting in an Uber. I mean, <laughs> I know, I know it's incredible. It's uh, the, the things these days that we can do. It's just it's pure fantastic. I think the future is really a lot more uh, sharing economy. And, you know, you, when you don't have to own something, you can borrow it from your neighbor and you know you're going to get it back because, you know, it's the reliability of having an app that's tracking it, that, you know, that you're connected to that person on an intimate level, whether it be a Facebook or LinkedIn, perhaps. Uh, you know, I, I don't need to own a, a hammer and a screwdriver anymore because I know I can borrow it from anyone on the block type of thing yeah you can still borrow it as long as you bring it back then after that it starts to get a, a bit well yeah um, you maybe have some digital currency on there you don't bring it back and now you're downvoted now no one's gonna rent to you ever again <laughs> it's that kind of uh social acceptance you know if you have to get to be good to society that you <laughs> continue to borrow yes sir so brian you you've been in business since the age of six uh were your parents entrepreneurs not at all. No. My mom started off as a school teacher and my dad is an eye doctor. He's a pediatric ophthalmologist helping kids' eyes. And there is no business background in my family in either lineage at all. So I'm the I'm the first entrepreneur. <laughs> so how did that happen at the age of six? So well every other kid just I guess nowadays wants to be playing games and not be on their phones. And you wanted to start a business. I love selling. <laughs> <laughs> Selling's fun. I mean, creating something that has more value is, is very exciting to me. And, you know, so for instance, the jewelry, you know, you, you buy a bunch of, of beads and hooks, you know, you spend $10 and maybe after you put a little time into it, it's worth a hundred. So that type of idea, you can create value out of such a small investment that kind of always got me going. Nice. So let's jump uh, over to one of your failures. It, was it business related? I've had many failures in life and I always use those as learning experiences. And there's definitely a couple business ones I'd be happy to share that I've overcome. Let's do it. So one of the, one of the biggest failures along the way was not really foreseeing how, how far the business would go and understanding the spatial concerns that we would need to keep up with our growth. So when I, when I first launched this business, uh, buying and selling cell phones out of college, I was in my parents' basement and I quickly overran that. And my you know, mom virtually kicked me out in about three months because she said, you're taking over our house, you know, get, your, get your junk out. So then I moved to an apartment in town 
And within, within less than a year, I barely had space to live. I was just inundated with boxes of phones and chargers and other shipping supplies. And so I'm, all, I'm like always looking for that, that next step I need to get to. And then so from there, I, I bought a house and converted the basement into our workspace. And you know that only worked for, for so long. I mean, we're shuttling boxes up and down the stairs in and out every day. I was using my garage as a, as a staging center for all these Macs I was buying. And then all of a sudden, I got a cease and desist letter from the city that said I can't have more than one employee working out of my house. So I had 14 days to find my next location. It was a little bit stressful at the time, but I made a couple of phone calls and I found a guy that had a, a 2,000 square foot space that we moved into in those two weeks. And you know that, that lasted us for another couple of years, but all of a sudden we were bursting at the seams again. So now we're back on the path looking for a new space. And we found our current location here in Blue Ash, Ohio. And right now we have about 8,000 square feet. And at the end of our initial lease, we had you know, virtually filled it up to the brim. And at this point, we're actually upgrading our warehouse with much bigger racking solutions and a forklift and some other ways to get more, get more use out of it. But it's like the constant feeling that we never have enough space to operate as efficiently and effectively as we possibly could. You know, there's no more office space to hire on more team members. You know, at this point, we need to double up people in offices or let them work in the conference room or remotely or whatever that might be. But you know, the, the sense is that you, it's so hard to plan for that growth ahead of time and take on the risk of having a larger space and you know, paying that rent. So for me, I think my biggest failure is the ability to forecast our growth and our, and our spatial needs along the way. And I'm guessing that is somewhat a, a good problem to have. That means as long as there's growth and you keep having to upgrade facilities, uh, that's always a good problem to have. Although, yes, a, a lot of complications come with it. I mean, moving's a pain in the butt. And, you know, certainly I, it's hard to buy a space because, you know, committing for something long term, if we don't understand the, the growth cycle of the business, uh, could put us at risk going forward. And, and that business is the is Sell Your Mac, correct? Sell Your Mac, yes. We're buying and selling all the Apple products. So uh, how did you start the Sell Your Mac? It was kind of born after the cell phone business. You know, my passion was not in cell phones. I've always been super passionate about Apple products. So when I saw that the cell phone market started to downtick a little bit, I ran into a deal where I bought a bunch of Macs and made a little bit of money on those. And then I started doing uh, some more arbitrage uh, sales with Apple products and ultimately wasn't sleeping enough because I was working so hard to find the products. So I wanted to build an inbound sales channel and that ended up being sellermac.com. And we've kind of grown it organically ever since, you know, we're top in Google search when people search for sell Mac. And that's really helped our growth along the way and uh, allowed us to, you know, find more customers to help them get cash back for their Apple products. So that is a pretty good domain to sell your Mac.com. And I know you're getting over a million the organic visitors per year. Did you always have that uh, domain from the start? We did. Yes. Yeah. That we, that was the first website we launched with. Right. That, that was pretty good. And I have hundreds of other domains that we own in order to that, uh, help us uh, ensure we're blocking other potential competitors and stuff like that and other future Apple oriented business ideas that we could launch. Did you ever consider having non Apple products? I get that question a lot. Um, you know, I really do not like non Apple products. And so for us, it, it wouldn't be, a, it wouldn't be a passion. And also we wouldn't know them as well. You know, we have so many Apple experts here. We're able to really understand the devices and make the best decisions for them, whether it's, you know, repairing them or selling them as is and really being able to diagnose and test them all correctly. I see that as a huge hurdle if we were to pivot into the Samsung space per se. You know, Samsung has 100,000 different uh, phones out there as opposed to Apple, you know, has 10. <laughs> yeah. So it's so much easier to understand the Apple market and to be able to price them out accordingly 
um, or to ensure you know we're as aggressive as we can on the pricing side. You know, we want to offer our customers the most cash back that we possibly can, and still be able to turn a profit and you know pay our team members. That's great. I I really like that answer. The fact that you want to do the one that you're passionate about and be knowledgeable and be like when somebody wants to have, sell or buy an Apple product, let's go to the expert. It's not the the store that sells everything. It's the experts. And Very to that point, a lot of these larger companies that we buy from, you know, they're not Apple experts and, and that that's fine. We don't expect them to be, but when they send us product, there's always issues with it not being exactly as described. And you know, let's say there's, you know, 90% that is accurate, but there's another 10% that's just wrong. And, you know, we provide information on what, what the true items are during our audit process. But, you know, we, we never hear that from our customers. They're not saying you, know, you sent us the wrong item. It's virtually never even happened. So that is something that we can kind of guarantee. And it really shows itself when you look at our feedback. You know, right now eBay is our biggest selling channel and we're a hundred percent positive feedback, which is amazing for the volume we're doing on there. And then if you look on our website and you see the reseller ratings, you know, we're 9.95 on there out of 10. You know, we're five stars on Facebook, you know, five stars on Yelp and all these other platforms. And if you're not an expert of sorts, there's really no way to garner these ratings and have the best customer experience, in my opinion. I did see that. And I was going to ask you about that because it's unbelievable, uh, like 100% five-star ratings. And that's really, really impressive. We've worked so hard for it. Our, our team is amazing. I got a couple of great guys on the customer service everyone's working hard to ensure that the items are as described and make sure everyone's happy along the way. Do you have a process of following up with people to ask for their review? As, um, as an Amazon seller, I know I get about only 3% of the people will leave a review unless they're unhappy. If they're unhappy, they'll go out of their way to leave a review, but sure. happy people don't. They just, okay, yeah, you did your job. I got my product. That's it. So do you have a follow-up with, uh, with your customers? So we used to send a direct eBay message asking for feedback. And so many people are turned off by it. Like some people get mad at you. And it, it's, it's so counterintuitive. You're like, oh, man, I just asked for positive feedback. You know, it's not a huge request. And as a small business, you need that to showcase to your customers that you're doing the right thing. So we stopped sending those messages because we feel it almost can drive some more negative activity perhaps on the positive side. So all our comments now are really just left organically. Nice. I guess I can see the point that so many people are being spammed daily by everything that when they get one more email, they'll, they'll just kind of be pissed thinking it is spam as well. Yeah. People get mad at just on generic emails. <laughs> so how do the Apple products hold their value uh, compared to anything else, uh, they hold uh, a Much lot of better, their... fortunately. Yes. I yeah, did. I mean, t typically you're going to lose the most in the first year, kind of as you would with, with any product. Um, and I don't know the exact, you know, loss rate of, of a Dell or a, a Samsung device, but I would say it's you know, at least two to one what it would be compared to an Apple device. And you know, maybe the first year of your Apple device you lose you know, 40% and after that, maybe 20% a year. But I would imagine um, a Dell computer, for instance, probably losing 80% of its value in the first one to two years from the standpoint that the, the product itself is not as expensive and uh, the components are cheaper to find elsewhere and stuff like that. And overall, just the branding of its, the brand doesn't hold its value uh, nearly as well as any Apple product. Yeah, I can, I can vouch for that because every now and then, when I sell a computer, it's uh, you can never get uh, more than 20% of what yeah. it costs you. So, I think, I think the biggest uh, driver behind that is really how long the Apple products last. You know, you can use an Apple product for a decade, but I can't even imagine using a PC for a decade. I mean, there's a very low likelihood that you're not going to have a virus in that PC in the first, in the first few years. <laughs> That's true. Do you find that there are more, I guess it's harder to get a virus on a, uh, on a Mac. It's not impossible, but it's harder. 
uh, do you find that there's uh, hackers or somebody going out of their way now to try to uh, create those viruses or is it still pretty safe? Fortunately not. I, th I think it has to do with how many businesses are still on PC that these hackers, I think, probably have their time better spent focusing on that market. And like you said, it's not impossible to get a virus on the Mac, but it is extremely difficult, especially if you're downloading apps that Apple has authorized through their Mac app store, you know, they're signed in a certain way that they're kind of guaranteeing that there's, you know, no malicious code in there. And then if you're clicking through emails and on random links and stuff like that, you have to execute a file to download and install a virus on your Mac. There's no like hidden way it can just install itself as opposed to a PC. You could just click on a link that looks safe and all of a sudden you have a virus seconds later. Yeah. True enough. So, <laughs> so tell me, how does, the Apple. <laughs> how does the whole process work? Uh, I have, a, say, an iPhone, and I want to sell it. How does it? How does this work? Sure. So pull up our website at sellyourmac.com. That's s e l l y o u r m a c dot com. And when you land on there, you're going to see a button to start the process. You know, click on there and select your device type. So you'd pick iPhone. And after you pick that, you're going to have some other drop down selections to pick the carrier and the hard drive size. And then you're going to be choosing the condition. And after you've kind of checked all those off, it's going to show you an instant price. So let's say that your, your iPhone you know, is worth $200. You're going to say, great, let's do it. And then you're going to fill in your contact information after you complete that and say, okay, we're gonna send you a prepaid shipping label in a box if you need it. Then you're gonna send the item into us. As soon as we get it, our first step is to wipe it. And if we can't wipe it, we're gonna end up destroying the hard drive. We make sure the customer data is always safe. I wanna be very clear about that. So after we've wiped it, we're gonna do our testing. And you know, we've got like a 30 point you know, diagnostic checklist we're gonna go through, make sure everything functions fine for the next user. And as soon as we checked it, it's going to go into our payments queue, and then we're going to send payment to the customer either via PayPal or check. So that whole process typically takes about a week start to finish. And it doesn't matter if, uh, if the customer is not in the States, you will still ship them the, the prepaid label, or is it only for the U.S.? We only send labels within the U.S. You know, th th some of the issues are uh, providing customs paperwork in other countries. That's kind of a barrier to sending out the labels. But we do offer credit for international customers. So, you know, yourself being in Canada, if you wanted to ship us your iPhone, you know, normally we would pay, let's say, $10 for a label. So we would just credit you an additional $10 on your quote to kind of compensate you for, for your time and money going into shipping it to us. Okay, very good. And what are some of the best practices to, to sell a device? Certainly uh, clean it up and wipe it yourself if you can. You know, when you go in to uh, general settings and you go to reset it, you're going to have to enter your iCloud email. And that's going to kind of reset it back to the point where we're able to take it from there. And we don't have to have any of your credentials anymore. And we do tell our customers uh, all these steps in our process before they send it in to ensure that we don't have to go back out and ask you for your iCloud email and password. Uh, and making sure that you've transferred your data uh, before you wipe it, obviously, is a good thing to do. Whether you're downloading it, uh, your photos, you know, straight into the, the photos on Mac, or you know, saving your videos to iTunes, or anything else you might have on your device. Nice. Do you, do you often get... Uh, any products that were sent to you still with a password on it? We do, and it's not a problem. You know, we just have to reach back out to the customer and just request that they send us their credentials. And if they don't want to do that, they can go on to iCloud.com and reset and wipe it from there. Very good. And at this point, you've paid out uh, about $20 million. Uh, we have, yeah, $20 million to our amazing customers. So constantly giving them cash back to find the latest and greatest Apple devices. Very good, Brian. Very good. 20 million. So pretty sizable. Uh, yes. And then you sell these products, uh, like you said, on mostly on eBay and you have on your, on your warehouse, would you sell to the Apple storefront? Uh, we have a retail storefront here. 
So I, just before this call, I was actually with an outstanding student that I was donating a laptop to, to go off to school. Uh, so we have a few different selling channels. You know, we have eBay as our kind of main one right now. We do Amazon, we have our retail store, and we have a, a list of bulk customers that want to buy, you know, 10 to a thousand at a time on some of these larger deals that we're doing. Nice. So do you want to talk a little bit about some of the steps that you took to, to achieve this kind of revenue? I mean, it's been a long time coming. I mean, it's just a lot of years of effort and building a team to make it happen. You know, it's definitely not all me. It's you got to be able to delegate and put the right people in place and really foresee which roles are, are crucial along the way. It's like every year, you know, we're evaluating, you know, our, our internal needs and adding more people to help fill the roles. Um, but kind of running lean along the way, you know, we try not to overhire. So we only, only bring people in when it's really pushing us, uh, you know, beyond our comfort zone of how much work it takes. Nice. And I know you volunteer a lot of your time too, and as a professional uh, leadership network and what else do you do to help the community? Like you said, you uh, donated a laptop, uh, yeah. I'm trying to give more technology away these days. I think that is one of the greatest tools to help people. And I was privileged to have technology growing up to be able to, you know, be on the internet and, you know, find out more information and, you know, be a lifelong learner. And without having a, a laptop or access to internet, I feel like that's just a huge disadvantage to someone. So I want to make sure that these uh, students have the tools that they're going to need to reach their dreams. Uh, and then the other ones, professional leadership network, that is a group associated with the uh, Boy Scouts and the Dan Beard Council. And we have one major event every year. We raise a ton of money to send off kids to summer camp that couldn't afford it otherwise. So this recent year, we raised about $67,000. And that sends about 250 kids to camp for a few weeks. Impressive. That's sure. really cool. Yeah, it is. The other charity that I'm very closely involved in is called Adopt-A-Class. And it's a group mentoring experience where we grow in as a business and we adopt the classroom and we go in there about once a month and we teach them, you know, different activities and we show them about our business and kind of show them another way out from some of the situations that they probably see in their communities. And we're, you know, pen palling uh, between visits and stuff like that to make sure we're, we're staying up with these kids and they have challenges that are, you know, hard for us to fathom. So really being able to just kind of be there for them and be a sounding board and help them through it. It's been crucial. And this adopt a class, is this just a normal class at a local school? You got it. So yeah. the classroom that I adopted uh, last year was at a school called Rothenberg Academy, which is in the heart of downtown. And, uh, you know, the students are underprivileged, don't have all the, all the mentors and uh, figures that, you know, we had growing up to look up to. So just kind of being there for them and being able to let them uh, ask us questions and show them about our business and ultimately, hopefully uh, get them to go to college or to get a job out of school. Very good. How about uh, maximizing productivity? Is there any kind of technology that you use or that Max have that could you help you with that? That's a good question. I think one thing I do to be more productive is just scheduling out my day. You know, if you put something on your calendar, you're much more likely to get it done. So really making sure that I have, you know, my day scheduled out every hour has been a good technique for me recently to get more accomplished in a shorter time span. And how do you do that? Is it like the first thing in the morning you create your schedule or you create a couple hours of schedule and then go back and redo it again? So some things will be on there, you know, for weeks ahead of time, you know, certain meetings and stuff like that. But I usually look at it kind of right at the beginning of the week and see what I need to accomplish that week and try to schedule those. And then in the morning of each day, I look at it again and, you know, is everything still relevant? Should I, should I cancel anything uh, or add anything more to my plate? And, you know, lately I've had more on my plate than I, and I probably should. So my you know, I'm back to back to back meetings. I feel like all the time right now, um, but able to get them all knocked out as opposed to if I didn't have those scheduled, I'd be kind of fumbling through my day, not knowing what was coming next. So just being very, uh, very on top of, of the schedule and make sure I have, you know, time to go between each activity. Yeah, absolutely. And is there anything else you're working on that we should expect in the future? 
working on new ways to make our process faster for our customers. Something that you're, you're going to see in the near future is an iteration to our website that allows you to trade in an item with just a serial number. So you don't even need to know what you have anymore, which is a constant problem for many Apple users that they just don't know the exact specs on their device and they don't know where to look. And we do have, you know, help buttons, uh, guide you along the way of, you know, where to find your processor speed and your hard drive and your RAM and stuff like that. Uh, but really making it much more seamless, you know, virtually enter your serial number and right away it tells you what specs you have and you can just, you know, click yes, that's, that's my specs and then continue from there and see the price. So really streamlining that and any other things I can add and make it a better experience. You know, last year we added these custom boxes that we ship out to all our customers upon request but we're gonna make that, uh, that process more streamlined to be able to get them the box even quicker going forward and just making sure that you have the tools to make it a easy, fast selling experience. That's a good point that you brought up. I guess you are listening to your customers because earlier I did a test and I went to sellyourmac.com and I put in, uh, for example, my iPhone and it, when it did ask me, uh, I guess it's a completely normal and simple question for anybody else. How many gigs do you have on your phone? And I was thinking, I don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> when, when the phone comes out, I go buy a phone and that's something I, I do like is uh, Apple phones and any other Apple product, of course. But I, I can't do without um, an Apple phone. But when I go to buy it, I just ask for the latest one and whatever they give me is what I get. So I don't really know much about their specs. So you probably have the base model. Yeah, more than likely, yeah. Yeah, and that, most people are more than fine with that. I mean, there's iCloud photo library now to ensure you can have all your photos and videos in the cloud. So there's less and less need for that on-device storage. And a lot of people can get by you know, paying a dollar extra per month to have everything stored in the cloud, which is a great way to back it up and ensure you're not having to pay an extra you know, $100 upfront for your device to have that, you know, higher, higher gigabit model. Yeah, that's what I do. I have, uh, I pay monthly for a 50 gig storage and it's just for pictures. Although yeah, I, I back up the phone on, on, onto the computer often. So it transfer everything can never be too safe. I having two backups is absolutely the way to go. One local and one in the cloud. You got it right. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. If any other Mac people are out there that want to have a, another backup system, I really recommend Backblaze. It's a great piece of software that upgrade uh, that sorry um, uh, that saves everything in the background. So it's unlike a, a, a time machine that's more uh, intensive during its backup process. This is really kind of seamless, and you don't even realize it's happening. But all the files are up there, and you can find them at a moment's notice. How about this? Um, something I only found out recently, like an external storage for an Apple phone uh, with like an SD card. I saw them uh, being sold on Amazon and it just connects to the phone and then you put an SD Plugs card. Plugs in the lightning port. Yeah. Do you ever use those? I have not personally and it's because I use iCloud that I don't need it. Um, but if I was maybe traveling and was taking, you know, thousands of photos on some, you know, crazy trip, I could see the use case for that, having those backed up another place. Yeah, I did think about that just so I could have a storage of audiobooks in there. And you can have a ton. I mean, for me, I have a if someone's looking at my setup right now, I have a newer MacBook Retina. So I had to have a dongle to plug into my USB USB C port to plug in uh, the head the headphone and the uh, mic and everything else. So it's a whole whole set of stuff. So I'm trying to avoid any extra dongles in my phone if I can. Nice. Brian, is there any book that has uh, helped you along your entrepreneurial life? I've read a lot of books along the way. And I think recommending books, it all comes down to the situation that someone has. It's hard to really recommend one book that's going to apply to a large group of you know, your listeners. So I would say if you're trying to create a vision for the future of your company, a great book I recommend is called Vivid Visions by Cameron Harold. 
and he is the former COO of 1-800-GOT-JUNK. He helped grow their business from 2 million to 150 million. And he has great ideas on how to really harness the, the power behind the vision and turn it into a, you know, a, a plan from there. And then if you wanted to scale up your business, I probably would recommend Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. It's a really powerful book that helps you uh, uh, foresee how to you know, kind of grow at 10x. If you wanted to track the performance of your business better, there's a great book called CEO Tools by Craig Kramers. And it's a lot about you know, how do you track you know, things, you know, trailing 12-month revenues and stuff like that to make sure you're constantly growing in the right direction as opposed to more backward looking, you know, financial statements that are more typical when you're working with an accountant. You mentioned uh, CEO and when you mentioned CEO for whatever reason, something triggered in my mind and do, do you guys have any connection uh, with Apple? Like has the Apple CEO recognized your business? I've never talked to Tim Cook. No. I'm guessing he knows who we are though. You know, we've advertised a ton in the Apple space you know, back in the day when Macworld Magazine was a thing and they had uh, Macworld events out in San Francisco, you know, we always had a nice presence there and I was advertising on the back cover of Macworld Magazine. So I know for a fact there's a lot of Apple employees that know who we are. So we've seen people you know, trading in with their Apple emails. And, you know, now Apple has their own buyback service. So I'm not seeing as many Apple people coming to us anymore at the moment. Um, but we've actually, you know, we've had some conversations with Apple's legal team that our logo back in the day had Mac as part of the mark. And it wasn't something that, you know, I thought about when I created it, but you know, it technically is infringing on their brand. So since then we've updated it and now our, now our logo is sell, sell your Mac with the S Y M and the smiley face here. So they were, they were very, very nice. When we talked to them, you know, they said that we were an integral part of their ecosystem. They actually loved what we do and by no means would they ever want to harm our brand. They just wanted to protect their brand and ensure that we weren't uh, you know, trading on their mark, which yeah. I understand. <laughs> Absolutely. And they did like, uh, I guess, your idea because now they are trying to replicate it by their buyback system, right? They've had a third party for, for a while and, and they uh, use a couple of different companies along the way. But yeah, they're trying to offer their, their customers the same thing you know, ability to cash in their devices to buy new. Uh, the one thing people notice if they compare us uh, versus them is that we pay a lot more money for Macs. We are, we try to literally pay, uh, you know, top dollar for every single Mac product. Very good. Very good. How about for the people that are listening and they have something to sell or they want to buy, where do they go and where do they find you? If you want to sell something, just go on our website, sellyourmac.com and submit your quote on there. It'll only take you one to two minutes, super easy process. If you want to buy from us, you can go on our eBay store, which is I sell iMac, I-S-E-L-L-I-M-A-C. Search for that. That should pop right up for you. If you want to connect with me, the two best places are probably Facebook and LinkedIn. Just search for Brian Burke on LinkedIn, and I went to Tulane University, so you could add that in there and find me pretty easily. I'm the guy with uh, the bow tie on. And uh, Facebook, uh, we have a SellyerMac.com page on there. That's a great way to find us. Awesome. All right, Brian, before I let you go, is there an advice that you want to leave everybody listening? I would tell everyone to follow their passion. When you are passionate about what you're doing, it will never feel like work and you'll actually be happy along the way. And I hear so many stories of people that are so unhappy at their job and it's a daily grind just to get out of bed and go to work. And you know why I love sleeping, I don't have any problem getting out of bed to go to sell your Mac every day. So pursue something you're passionate about and you'll be so much happier long term and it, life, is, life is all about being happy. So pursue your dreams. I love it. Okay, everybody. This is Brian Burke. Brian, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Quinn. It was a pleasure. No problem. All the best. Cheers. Bye.